welcome all of you to this webinar from the conversation series. Uh, we are already into time, so I will not take very long, but I'll just take a minute or two to introduce our esteemed guest and uh, uh, the faculty in conversation with her today. As we know, the topic of our webinar today is making and influencing policy in India, interrogating center state dynamics and the challenging of governance. Our esteemed guest for today is Yamini Ayer. Yamini is president and chief executive of the Center for Policy Research, a public policy research think tank. She was previously a senior research fellow and founder of the accountability initiative at the center. Through this initiative, Yamini is credited with pioneering one of India's largest expenditure tracking surveys for elementary education. Yamini is also a regular columnist in newspapers such as the Hindustan Times, Live Mint, The Indian Express, to name a few. Her work sits at the intersection of research and policy practices, and her research interests span the fields of public finance, social policy, state capacity, federalism, governance, and the study of contemporary politics in India. Yamini has a BA in philosophy from St. Stephen's College, Delhi, and then an MA in Social and Political Science from the University of Cambridge, and an MSc in Development Science from the London School of Economics. Yamini is a TED Fellow and a founding member of the International Experts Panel of the Open Government Partnership. Welcome, Yamini. We are very delighted to have you with us here today. Thank you. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. In conversation with Yamini, Today, we have Professor Patrick French. Professor French is an award-winning historian, biographer, and political analyst. And he has a PhD in South Asian studies and an MA in English and American literature from the University of Edinburgh. Professor French is the author of several books and his books have been translated into more than a dozen languages and have won many reputed national as well as international awards. As Dean, of the School of Arts and Sciences at Ahmedabad University, Professor French has promoted interdisciplinary teaching and research and has extended the scope of courses to cover Indian and South Asian intellectual traditions in the humanities and social sciences. Under his leadership, the school has launched a Bachelor of Arts and a Bachelor of Science Honors program alongside an integrated Master's in Life Sciences and also a very reputed doctoral program as well. Welcome, Professor French. And we are delighted to have you in conversation with Yamini um, today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Bijan. Without taking any more time, I will hand over to you now. Great. Well, uh, welcome to everybody who has joined us uh, this afternoon. And welcome particularly to uh, Yamini Aya. Um, I just apologize. There is a little bit of banging going on outside my window, which just started at the identical moment the seminar started, but I'm hoping it may, it may reduce at some point uh, this afternoon. So, um, Yamini, I've got a whole load of different things I want to ask you about, and I'm sure the audience will also have questions, but let's start a little bit with those um, polls. I didn't know what the subject of the polls were going to be, and I was quite struck by uh, the fact that One Nation uh, won election. There seemed to be narrow support in favour of that. Um, the third poll about problems in implementation of social welfare, um, what was interesting there was that it was such an even balance between whether these were policies from above corruption or issues over, 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 over implementation. But actually the, the poll that startled me the most was the second one, um, because it seems that people in India have faith in the bureaucracy, trust in the bureaucracy, um, but they think that corruption sort of happens because it's very slow and inefficient. And I think in many countries, you wouldn't get the trust plus the idea that you have to use bribery to, to have a breakthrough. But um, what were your, which, what, what, were, what to you were the most striking things about those poll results? I'm, I'm presuming that they, they were maybe not a surprise to you in the way they were to me, because of your prior <laughs> knowledge of, of public opinion. <laughs> no, 
polls are always a surprise uh, and, and often also a very pleasant surprise because it leaves you feeling that there's some hope still uh, in the midst. Of, you know, I, I'm now getting middle-aged and cynical, so I, I, I really feel happy when I see polls from younger audiences that make you feel that there's still some hope. But first, just wanted to say thank you very much for inviting me here. Uh, I've long wanted to engage more with the Ahmedabad University. And Patrick, you may recall, in a world when we didn't have to talk to each other over strange devices, uh, we had spoken about uh, uh, engaging more uh, for CPR with Ahmedabad University. So, I, so it was an absolute pleasure and privilege for me to have the opportunity to be here. Um, on the polls, I think uh, what, well, I, I, I'm not surprised that we have a deep trust in the bureaucracy, largely because uh, Increasingly, in fact, uh, the state has become very much part and parcel of our everyday lives. Uh, right now, uh, I'm puzzling over, you know, whether I should or should not put on a mask when I'm sitting alone in my car. Uh, that means that I'm having to go back to all sorts of government orders to try and make sense of them. Yeah. Uh, and 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 for for the, for for a vast percentage of India, perhaps not so much you and I who tend to exit from the state, uh, the state is both the source of all possibility as much as it is a source of all evil. Uh, and, and this struck me a lot. I, I grew up uh, in India in the generation that uh, with the first generation to live through the joys of liberalization. Uh, the state was exiting from many aspects of our lives. Most notably, we got uh, mobile phones uh, arrived at some point. And uh, I grew up in a household with two other sisters as teenagers, we had one government phone, and you can imagine how much mayhem that caused. So it was this big celebration of the state exiting from our everyday lives uh, and, and the market sort of coming in uh, to, uh, to fulfill all our dreams and aspirations. In some senses, there was not so much a distrust of, of the state uh, as much as a frustration with the state. When I first started working in, the, in, 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 in an NGO uh, and began to travel outside of my cosmopolitan uh, uh, elite hub, uh, I started, uh, what struck me most in conversations with people was how much the state that we were celebrating, of whose exit we were celebrating, was in fact uh, something that everyone was yearning for. The government will come, it'll build a school, the government will come, it'll build a road, the government will come, it'll build a health center, and my life will have possibilities. Uh, yet every experience of the government was always one of being mired in red tape and being mired in corruption. And so I think actually the relationship that we as citizens have forged with government is not so much of one of deep distrust as much as deep disenchantment, because it is a reality that many aspects of the implementation failures that many, uh, uh, if, uh, many of, the, uh, of the students here were referring to, I think, in the polls, the red tape, uh, the sarkari kagas that drives us all crazy, uh, are very much part and part of the experience of frustration and a sense that the state has let us down in so many very fundamental ways. Uh, and I think that's what's reflected here um, and continues to be reflected in our relationships with the state. What puzzles me is how much uh, the act of voting, which is so fundamental to our DNA, in India, even uh, you know, even today, and I'm sure we'll talk about this at some point, as many aspects of the state institutions appear to be functioning in ways that are far less democratic, uh, the act of voting and the act of an election is by far the most valued experience of being a citizen and experience of, uh, of democracy that remains very much intact, even though the ways in which it unfolds have gone through many transformations. Uh, yet, we seem to get very frustrated with the act of elections. Um, and, and, and that dichotomy is something that uh, I, I think we should dissect a little bit more uh, as we go through. I think we've bought into the belief that the, really, the real reason why government doesn't do its job is because politicians are the problem. Um, and and, and it, it suits politicians too. There is a very clear reason why the one nation, one election idea is now unfolding so much in our public and political discourse. Uh, Yet at the same time, uh, I, you know, it isn't 
the act of democracy is so important because that's the one way in which the politician and the bureaucracy can actually be held accountable mm -hmm. and questions can be asked for precisely the frustrations uh, that we express when we talk about red tape and, and corruption. I, I want to ask you a little bit about public policy in an Indian context and what you actually understand by public policy. Because I'm thinking, although we've got a lot of distinguished uh, professors and academics, some of them from Ahmedabad University and some from other universities who are here, uh, there are also quite a few students. What, what do you mean by public policy? And a kind of linked question, um, you know, how did you come to head the Center for Policy Research and what are the kind of main things that you have to focus on in your, in your role? Ah, what do we mean by public policy? That's the existential question that we keep asking ourselves <laughs> on a fairly regular basis. I think what we, what, what, well, I think, let me put it this way, there are many ways in which we can define public policy, but I think for most of us at CPR, we think about public policy uh, very much as the broad frameworks within which governmental uh, decision making uh, is articulated and through that articulation the the government deploys its tools whether those are schemes programs processes uh, to be able to implement um, and reach the outcomes of that broad framework that has been articulated and what we see as our role as public policy researchers is uh, both to to shape the framework, ask the questions. Uh, very often when we talk to bureaucrats, they sort of describe their jobs as, you know, we, we conflate the long term for the, we conflate the short term for the long term. We have to respond to the here and now. Uh, and we don't have the luxury of asking the questions or building the framework. Uh, we see our role as being able to ask those difficult questions, critiquing the frameworks and accepted perspectives as they are, keeping the long term in the view. We see our role also as bringing the public sphere into the dialogue uh, within the policy space. The bureaucrat, the politician interacts with this public sphere in a particular frame. Uh, and as policy researchers, we draw on the public sphere both to shape the debate, but also to learn what are the critical questions that we should be asking. And third, we see ourselves as in some ways a critical part of the feedback loop. Uh, we don't believe that policy can be framed uh, sitting uh, in, in, in Shastri Bhavan and Krishi Bhavan. Uh, mm -hmm. We believe that it is crucial to create a space for a multitude of voices mm -hmm. uh, to articulate their experience with policy and the questions that they have. And we see ourselves as a platform that convenes those voices, but also as eyes and ears on the ground that can bring feedback into the hallowed portals of Sh Shastri Bhavan, Krishi Bhavan, South Block and North Block. Okay, and how did you become the boss of Center for Policy Research? By complete sheer accident. <laughs> I actually envisage a life of uh, being very much a practitioner and not a researcher. At some point, mm -hmm. we are all faced with the million dollar question of uh, do you enter the big bad world of work or do you go into the ivory tower of a PhD? And I, I, I chose, it, it. for me, it was a very straightforward, I'm interested in, in being in the big bad world. Mm -hmm. um, and I spent some time uh, working with uh, the NGO sector, a couple of in, uh, NGOs in Delhi that were mushrooming at the time. Uh, uh, the Grameen Bank model had become uh, quite the flavor of the, uh, of the few years when I first started working. There were many NGOs that were working with women's self-help groups. Um, but I found uh, that my personality was not suited to the NGO, partly because I was constantly questioning uh, perhaps a little too much, mm -hmm. uh, but also that you know questions of scale, uh, the role of the state were very much front and center in my mind. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I sort of meandered into the World Bank uh, for a little while, thinking that uh, a space that allows you this, uh, you know, a little bit of time to ask questions, do some research, understand and make sense of what you're seeing on the ground while at the same time being part of the practice by engaging very closely with the state 
uh, would would be ideally suited to me. Um, uh, and, I, and I did envisage a full career uh, as a bureaucrat within the World Bank. But very, but, but you know, a few years in, it was a wonderful experience I encountered. Uh, uh, I worked with, it, with with colleagues that have been mentors and supporters and shaped my understanding of many of the critical development questions in, in ways that I wouldn't have had I not had that experience. Mm. Uh, but uh, I did find it difficult to be in a bureaucracy uh, as large as the bank, where in some ways the, the, the government was always the client, but this, the, the bureaucracy itself was fundamentally accountable to itself in Washington. Mm. Um, and that works. That's how uh, uh, international agencies are structured, um, but not it, it didn't suit me. So that's how I, I came into CPR. I, my predecessor, Pratap Mehta, was, uh, had become president at CPR a few years before I met him. And he told me, this is a place where you can just experiment and do what you want, and no one will ask you any questions. Uh, okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm here to, to, to ask the questions, though. So I've got another one for you, which is really about the comparison between the Indian way that public policy operates and the US way, which you kind of touched on right now. And I'm thinking back to about, it must be about eight years ago, um, and it was a sort of public policy setting in Delhi uh, with predominantly Indian think tank people and then some from the US. And I remember there was the a sort of senior figure from a major US vehicle car transport firm. And one of the subjects that came up was, uh, if I'm remembering correctly, it was multi-brand retail. And pretty much everybody in that meeting was saying, you know, this is a, a great idea. There's a kind of consensus that there's time to move on this. And this guy from the car company, the US car company stands up and he says, well, everybody's in agreement on this. So presumably the government's gonna, gonna implement it uh, now or implement it soon uh, in an Indian context. And everybody who was familiar with India and the Indian system sort of looked as if to say, well, the fact that everybody thinks it's a good idea means nothing. That doesn't, doesn't mean that it's gonna be implemented because there are always so many other factors to consider. You know, one of them being center state relations, which we'll come on to in a moment. But the other being just the whole way that the Indian system works and the kind of interface between politicians and the, bu the bureaucracy. So, I mean, so why, why is it so different here compared to other typical democracies, if there's such a thing as a, a typical democracy anymore? Because I think we are still a society that is going through very deep and profound transitions, living through very complex uh, uh, and, and very varied uh, contexts. And therefore, uh, there is no one size fit all policy that works for everyone. And the beauty of going through a structural transformation in a deeply democratic context mm. is that you cannot use uh, uh, blunt instruments uh, to impose uh, uh, shifts from the top. You have to be able to navigate and negotiate multiple interest groups, which ultimately uh, in a brave democracy with a brave politics would I think uh, create the right kind of answers that may or may not suit uh, suited booted economists. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the challenge for India is not so much uh, the frustration between what some constituencies think are good ideas and others think are bad ideas and the compromises that have to be struck. It is a lack of uh, political courage and conviction uh, that ultimately uh, uh, is able to negotiate the right kind of pathway and work through the different interest groups to convince them to come on board and find ways to address their concerns. Hmm. Okay, so I've got two more questions that are particular to public policy and, and what it is. One, one of the common sort of misapprehensions you, you mentioned in, in a previous conversation to me is that people will come into public policy and think it's all about writing op-eds and writing papers and that's all that counts and that, you know, you do that and then, then your work is done. Can you just say a little bit more about what actually it means being in an organization like CPR? I mean, most of, most of what you do what works most effectively through which route or which mechanism? Mm. 
So there's no one way, I think, uh, but, but I think the, the, one, uh, uh, the one most critical thing is to have a really robust ground level feel of the issues that you're working on, whatever they might be. At CPR, we work on a wide range of things from climate change uh, and environmental justice to urbanization, public service delivery. Uh, it's a wide range. Uh, but uh, sorry, I think, uh, am I audible? I, it froze briefly. so. Okay. Uh, it, it briefly. First. Okay, great. So, so to me, uh, the most important thing is to build a really strong foundation of having a robust ground level experience of the of the consequences or the experiences of the issues you're working on for the constituencies that you seek to represent through your research, through your engagement. Uh, credibility of what you do, integrity of what you do, with a ground level understanding, is the only tool that we have uh, as uh, as actors uh, within the public sphere and within the policy sphere to be able to make a convincing argument to those across the table. Op-eds are nice things, but they should be the last place to start, not the first place to start. Right, okay. And then an another question that I had for you was, I know that when I went to the uh, conference uh, that you held in Delhi, it must have been about a month or so before, the outbreak of the coronavirus pandemic or maybe a couple of months before. I remember noticing that pretty much all of the events and all of the panels that you organized there had gender balance, which is very unusual within the sphere of public policy. I think not only in India, but globally, it tends to be a male dominated space. I mean, as do some bits of the social sciences or maybe not to the same degree. And maybe you, you could just say something about sort of how you did that. Was it in fact that there were numerous women who were well qualified to be on panels who you invited? Was it to do with the fact that you are in an unusual position in a very male dominated space and that therefore you kind of think of it and approach it differently? Well, my colleagues hold my feet to the coals and ensure that I do the right thing. <laughs> so I, I think it was certainly, uh, it's it's partly by uh, being more conscious of the fact that we must ensure that there is gender balance. Uh, and, uh, and also uh, knowing that we essentially are looking for the best minds on an issue. And if you look hard, you will always get uh, gender balance uh, in identifying the best minds on the issue. But you know, one of the things that really struck me uh, about this gender issue is how deeply yeah. in structural it is in a sense. Uh, when I came to CPR and started working, uh, set up the sort of accountability initiative team, uh, we, we did a com combination of quantitative uh, da uh, data heavy uh, research work and some amount of qualitative, more ethnographic work. And sitting next to us was the climate change, was my colleague Navroz and Lavanya, both of whom work on climate change issues. Um, and, and what was interesting was that every time we'd put out these job advertisements, uh, accountability initiative would get uh, male applicants for the quant work and female applicants for the qualitative work. And when we, we had a team that was spread out in different parts of the country, so we needed a program manager, that too were largely female. Uh, the, 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 the transition with my climate change colleagues was even more intriguing because in the first few years, this was the early 2009 through 2011 or so, uh, most of their research associates and, uh, and others who, who applied and got jobs were women. Uh, and in fact, we, we talked about this because I would always joke that I'm looking for men to hire onto my team. We can't be an all woman team. That's exactly the opposite of what we want. Uh, and they had the opposite problem. But as soon as climate change became a matter of hard diplomacy uh, and a very mainstream issue, suddenly you saw a really good gender balance. So there is, I think we also need to be asking ourselves beyond uh, panels and, 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 uh, and, and representation, why is it that people make the kind, why is it that gender shapes the kinds of even disciplinary choices people make in the social sciences? And how does one address that from the undergraduate level onward uh, to enable that, uh, to, to enable a more equitable distribution of uh, gender across different kinds of engagements within the social sciences. Okay, so if we if we can move now on to federalism within an Indian context and the kind of center state uh, equation, I mean, you know, there, there are certain things which maybe have a sort of historic basis, but in terms of the fault lines within the architecture of center state uh, 
uh, relations at the moment, how would you say that that balance uh, should be perceived? And I think maybe maybe this question should extend sort of beyond the present government into the last sort of 10 or 15 years. You know, where is India at now in terms of that center state relations? So, you know, the, the India's sort of federal architecture uh, has always had a peculiarity or uh, in it, in the sense that it has always had deeply centralizing tendencies. Uh, both in terms of the organization of the political federal uh, structure, as well as the fiscal and administrative federal structure. Um, yet in many ways, at least the political architecture actually enabled a much more deeper federalism for India um, until recently. Uh, in that uh, the ability for the central government to reorganize states, for instance, uh, enable to some degree uh, 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 India to be able to respond to assertions of identity um, uh, and, and, and anxieties of ethnicity uh, in ways that were enabling and strengthening of democracy. Uh, and particularly in the sort of uh, second and third phases of the Indian party system at the 1990s onwards as regional parties began to play a more dominant role both in, uh, uh, in, in national politics politics looked like, the political party structure looked like it was decentralizing in interesting ways. Yet for, yet the political decentralized domain never really translated into a demand for fiscal and administrative decentralization in ways that genuinely empowered states to fulfill their constitutionally assigned responsibilities. In fact, through this phase, it, it sort of, it, it had always been a trend, but it, and, uh, and it, 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 it sort of started getting exaggerated in the 1970s, but we saw this all the way uh, coming uh, in, coming to a head in in the 90s and especially the early 2000s, where essentially the central government started encroaching on many issues of states. So that has been the context in which we get to 2014, where we're once again back in the context of a single party majority, the coalition era is for the moment over. Uh, and when you have a shift in the political structure, you inevitably will see new fault lines emerge in center state relations. So what are, what are the new fault lines of the last six, seven years? So I think two very uh, important ones. One, uh, so one, the presence of a, a strong single party majority at the center. And for a substantive part, particularly of the first term of this, uh, of the NDA, uh, 2014 through 2019, we also saw uh, what had something that had ha a trend that re-emerged, a historical trend that re-emerged after many, many decades mm -hmm. of seeing a lot more political alignment between the center and the state. That funded fundamentally reshapes the kinds of political pulls and pressures in uh, the uh, shaping and making of federalism. Uh, uh, secondly, and not unlinked to the politics, uh, is uh, the shift, the use rather, of uh, the centralizing elements of the constitution to reframe the nature of center state relations, the conversion of a full-fledged state into a union territory back uh, in August of 2019, the recent amendment uh, that was passed by parliament to the 69th amendment that takes strips off the Delhi's uh, legisl union territory of Delhi's legislative assembly of essentially of all of its powers. Can I, can I ask you, uh, Yamini, did, did those things, those changes surprise you or were you thinking this kind of very radical structural change might be on, on the horizon? It surprised me in the, in the, in the cleverness of how it was done. Article 370 perhaps politically was going to see a change, right. but the conversion of a state into a union territory uh, uh, certainly surprised me. But what surprised me even more was that all the regional parties and in fact all the state governments, chief ministers should be anxious about the ability of the Indian parliament, regardless of what political party you belong to, to be able to do this by the sleight of hand. Yet no one spoke up. Uh, in fact, the, the, you know, this is sort of been discussed a lot, uh, the irony of the Aam Admi Party being amongst the first uh, supporters of the move to nullify Article 370, only to find the very same moves being placed back onto it uh, a, about a year later. Do you, th so, do you think that any, anybody anticipated that it might result in border tension with China? <laughs> 
I think in its hubris, uh, uh, the, 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 the government in power certainly did not anticipate what would happen. Mm -hmm. uh, however, I think anybody that is familiar with the complexity of, uh, of Kashmir and, and, the, and the complexity of our borders, uh, could well have said this is not going to be uh, uh, something that you can just push through without having some kind of repercussion. What form that might but it, come but, in. But you, but you see it as a sort of un unexpectedly clever and subtle and very quick uh, move from a sort of internal administrative or political point of view. Yes. And like you're saying, the Ahmad Mi party, it rather came back to bite them. Well, and, and I mean, what's been particularly disappointing is that our courts have chosen to uh, uh, act with absolutely no sense of uh, urgency on the matter. So it's sort of, there is a, it, it's, it's a capitulation of all institutions that were meant to serve as checks and balances. And the surprising element of states in some ways being complicit in their, in, in the undermining of the very federal architecture that they have, that have given them political power. Sure, sure, sure. Um, I, I know that you published a, a paper relatively um, recent, recently on the decline of regional party power, I think with Nilanjan Sarkar. Uh, you've also written about uh, One Nation, uh, BJP and the Future of Indian Federalism with Louise Tillin. Do you want to say a little bit about your, uh, your, your take uh, on this and why you chose those particular subjects to, to publish on? Well, I think for two uh, two reasons. Federalism. I came to uh, think about federalism uh, largely from my own field experiences uh, of working uh, in core areas of social policy at the grassroots. Uh, and the one thing that hit me time and time again was how distanced uh, power was. The, by power, I mean the ability to take decisions and serve citizens was from the levels of government that citizens had most access to, despite the fact that we have a 73rd and 74th Amendment, despite the fact that every village, every town has a municipality, there's a block development office, uh, there's a block office filled with uh, buzzing with uh, administrators and so on and so forth. Yet the ability to even take simple decisions, uh, can I fix the roof? Do I have the funds to fix the roof of a school building? Or, you know, can I buy, can I spend more getting an extra tutor into my school because the children need a little bit more school uh, a, a, a bit, a pedagogical support? All of those were decisions taken at the district, taken at the state level, taken at the, taken at the center. And what it did was two very important things. First, it created a culture of accountability that was very much about accounting. So uh, the, the, the system was only accountable to itself by virtue of what uh, bills and vouchers it was able to maintain to show that it was following the orders that were coming from the top. And it also therefore created a culture of uh, service delivery amongst the state at the local level of being no more than passive agents responding to rules when they needed to be and for the rest, uh, uh, as, as one, there's, a, there's an education office post called uh, CRCC, Cluster Resource Center Coordinator, and a Bihari CRCC described his post as complete rest in comfortable conditions that best describes the dynamics of local administration. So respond passively to rules and for the rest of the time it's complete rest in comfortable conditions. And citizens holding the state accountable uh, really didn't have too much ability to uh, see responses from the state because the state could easily say this rests somewhere else. Uh, so that's what brought me into trying to make better sense of why the Indian state is so deeply centralized administratively and fiscally. But as our politics also began changing, uh, it perhaps somewhat belatedly dawned on me how, how crucial uh, the idea of federalism. So the Indian state is not necessarily federal in its traditional sense. It's a holding together federalism. The constitution calls it a union of states. But the idea of the, the fundamental philosophy of federalism was so crucial uh, to the idea of India uh, and so important to being able to create a democratic context, uh, that a, a democracy where multiple identities, ethnicities, regional aspirations, language aspirations could find a space to articulate themselves and live in peace and harmony. So for me, federalism is both about what, the, what democracy and the constitution and its aspirations represent, uh, 
uh, but is also the only way that citizen rights uh, can actually be genuinely fulfilled because it's not for you and me sitting in Delhi to really know what needs and, uh, and priorities exist for someone living, forget, you know, I live in Jangpura, I can't really say what you need in Jorbag for that matter. <laughs> so. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> that's very Lutyens, uh, Lutyens Delhi. <laughs> um, so I'm so what, what I'm thinking now is if you go back to the kind of history of why that federal system was set up, I mean I think there, there was an assumption around the time um, when the constitution came in that India was so disparate that crucially the thing of bringing in the the 561 approximately princely states uh, assumed that you could sort of merge people or meld people into uh, a federal structure. But what I, what I think people never really anticipated in the 1950s was just how unified or centralized India would become and how quickly that would happen, the expectation really that things could be driven from the center. Um, you've alluded to the fact that when there's a strong government at the center, they naturally want to centralize. It's a sort of understandable uh, impetus. You know, equally when uh, governments are, are on it's sort of more of a kind of coalition ground, they might go for various forms of either uh, sort of decentralization to the regions or even down to village level. If you were to try to place it a little more theoretically of what you think would or should work in a country as large, as disparate as India, uh, you know, what, what, what would be the most effective future form of governance? Would it be a very significant kind of decentralization of a kind that everybody at the center is always reluctant to, to do? Not just at the center, I have to say states are uh, equal uh, uh, party to, to this. Right, or, or, even, or even actually historically, in some cases, even more extreme. In yeah. The yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, to my mind, one of the fundamental governance challenges for India uh, outside of uh, the, the political narratives is really that of what level of government should perform what level of function. I, I don't think we've ever fully uh, articulated uh, this and arrived at a social or political consensus about this. The Constitution has a very clear uh, uh, sort of separation of powers what the center should do, what the states should do, what should be done concurrently, and then what goes down to the municipal and the uh, and, and the rural uh, local government level. Uh, but the administrative challenge of actually building this out into core roles and responsibilities and allowing that level of government to fulfill that function uh, and be held fully accountable for it. That is a consensus that we haven't yet reached. The central government is incentivized naturally to centralize. State governments have always done everything in their power to withhold uh, 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 the devolution of powers to local governments. Um, and what is particularly intriguing to me has been how much uh, civil society too has played into this in, in the sense that if you look at some, particularly the history of rights-based movements in, from the 90, late 1990s to the present, uh, the push had always been put education onto the current concurrent list. Shall we be thinking about health on the concurrent list? States don't necessarily do what they're supposed to do. Um, legislate at the center uh, and then let, uh, you know, and, and, and it's also because there is a fundamental first principles question that we, we we do have to confront when we talk about decentralization, which is that you are like, you may well see uh, a certain degree of um, uh, a, a certain degree of uh, um, disparity, uh, divergence uh, in, 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 in patterns as different states make different kinds of choices. And so the real critical question uh, uh, that, that needs to be answered is how do you ensure that there's a minimum level uh, of a standard of public services to all citizens, while at the same time ensuring that states have their own pathways on which they can choose where to go and allow the democratic process uh, to ensure that citizens exercise their rights and hold their governments accountable. So if Bihar is not spending money, enough money on education, uh, the Bihari voters should certainly be asking questions of the government of Bihar. Right now they do, but they can, but the government of Bihar can always say, well, Delhi didn't give me money, so it's actually Delhi's fault. 
Right, absolutely. Um, okay, so we've got about 10 minutes left before we want to move to questions from the uh, audience and, and other participants. Um, so there, there are two, two points really that I want to, to try to deal with in this time. And one is really the current administrative response to uh, the coronavirus pandemic. Um, the, the, you know, very recently there's been a bit of a standoff between state and center over the issue of how it should be managed. You had the way that the government has been using things like the Disaster Management Act, uh, also using the Pradhan Mantri, Garib Kalyan Yojana as a, as a sort of mechanism. Um, can you just say a little bit about the fact that this is obviously a uniquely challenging thing for any government to do? What can we learn about the way that the Indian state works from the way that the uh, national and state level governments have responded, the, the kind of architecture, the kind of mechanisms of the state they've used in response. So before we come to COVID, one important thing to say is that we've, we have in the last five years or six years, seven years since 2014, gone through a very significant institutional change in how center state fiscal and administrative relations are negotiated. The planning commission, which was, I'm certainly not advocating for, it was always a symbol of excessive state power, central power, and was not a constitutional body. But one of the roles and functions it did play which I think in retrospect, one looks back and says we didn't give enough credit for, it, it hosted the National Development Council and it created an institutional architecture where, where states from the political uh, arms of the state chief ministers and ministers as well as the executive had an institutional mechanism to deliberate dialogue, squabble uh, with the center. Uh, the constitution has something called the Interstate Council, which uh, all governments have chosen to ignore. It's a, it's a moribund, defunct institution, but one that I, I believed urgently needs to be revived. So we are operating in the, so we, we arrived at COVID in the context of uh, centralizing government, politically centralizing government, without institutional spaces for center state negotiations to take place. Health is a state subject. It was only inevitable that a pandemic, a health crisis, required states to take the front and center role, states did. Uh, however, they needed the center to both provide them with fiscal support as well as do coordination roles. Yes. Uh, neither of these have been done as a center chose not to give any money to states, leaving them to do market borrowing instead, yes. uh, while at the same time taking full bureaucratic control of most decisions. We're seeing that with vaccines, yes. for instance. And, and I mean, you, you've suggested that there should be a National Empowered Emergency Disaster Council. Yes, our uh, think you know our thinking was the national disaster management itself was designed for a very different kind of disaster. Natural disasters are traumatic, but they are one-time affairs, and they tend to not move around in the same at the same pace as uh, as, as as a virus. Uh, the idea was that we needed something that would be alive through the different waves and, uh, and 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 challenges of COVID, and that would also be able to recognize that COVID unfolds spatially. So just like we're seeing now, it's eight states contributing to the bulk of the cases. These eight states right now need the bulk of our health resources, probably need some economic stimulus because the economies there are slowing down, mm -hmm. uh, et cetera. And so we needed a space uh, 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 where the state and the center could dialogue and deliberate mm -hmm. and arrive at what were mature, supportive, well-coordinated emergency responses. That, of course, has not happened. Okay, that's interesting. Okay, so I'm, I'm actually going to throw in one, 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 more, one more sort of current events or, or fairly recent events question, which is, is about the farmers' protests in India and the sort of agrarian crisis versus current reforms. Um, what would you say is underlying that? And do you think that is a, a dispute that's going to run and run during the next few months? Well, I think two really important things. You started out by with the with the discussion about uh, car manufacturing, and uh, you know, uh, a group of people around the table uh, think this is the right thing to do, but the politics is more complicated. Yeah. Uh, to my mind, uh, the farm reforms and everything that has happened is a really important reminder of us of just this. There are there is no doubt that reforms are needed, uh, but 
to do the reforms, uh, we have to be able to step away from uh, 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 very uh, narrow prisms of trying to under, of, of, of that we place on how we think reforms yeah. should take place. Uh, you know, if you go back to the reforms of the 1990s, uh, a lot of those were reforms that were that needed elite consensus, uh, and that elite consensus already existed. Uh, and we were also dealing with a context where the policy maker and those who were impacted by those reforms uh, or, or those who were participants in that reform uh, actually understood each other. Uh, the, when you're talking about something like agricultural markets, no one sitting in a suit will understand the diversity, the complexity, the shifts that agricultural markets have gone through over these last 20, 25 years. There is no clear consensus. So that is why agriculture is a state subject. Uh, right. And I think that what the center did by, uh, you know, sort of taking a state subject and legislating it through parliament reflects two important frustrations. One, a, a frustration that we have as a nation with the, with the inability to effect change at the state level or the, or the slow movement of change at the state level, and therefore pressures are put at the center. And secondly, uh, it shows the complete lack of regard that we have, or our politics has at this point in time for uh, due process and for deliberation and dialogue. So we move ordinances, we get things passed through parliament, and we assume that that will create its own consensus. And I think the people of India through the protests and farmers of India through the protests have certainly shown that it's not as simple. You need to take us along, you need to dialogue, engage with us, and understand our perspectives before designing templates of reforms. And therefore, this should be done at the state level. Is it working? Is it my Wi-Fi or? I think uh, uh, the Pat it's Patrick, Patrick okay. connection. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 okay, I was just not sure. So. We will have to wait for a few minutes till uh, Professor French rejoins. Sure. Um, uh, Yamini, uh, do you suggest that we take up a few, uh, some of the sure, questions sure, sure. while we wait for Patrick sure. to join in? Sure. All right. Uh, he's right here. I'll just admit him. Sorry about that, everybody. Apologies. We had a, a, a total power failure, um, <laughs> which, I, which is now just... Uh, I've just done a kind of temporary fix, so I'm hoping you're able to to hear me okay now. Um, anyway, I, I presume that the the seminar ran on quite happily. Uh, so let me just ask a uh, a closing um, question from me before uh, audience questions can come in. And that was really, uh, you know, for particularly students who are in the audience who are thinking of entering the field right now, who want to work either in public policy or in NGOs or think tanks or they want to take a particular skill that they've learned at the university and think, well, you know, how can I use that in a, in a public setting for national or international good? Um, what would be your thoughts about the, the best kind of routes for them if they want to pursue that kind of study or career? Uh, 
So I think without a doubt, the first thing that you should do is go to the field uh, in whatever way uh, you want to. And that that is very much a, an individual and personal decision. The exciting thing uh, about today compared to when I was uh, sort of starting off my career is that there are lots of really interesting ways in which you can engage. You can do this by being part of research projects. You can do this by being part of social movements. You can do this by being part of uh, implementing NGOs. Uh, and you can also now increasingly do this by being part of government. It's, uh, I mean, this is part of our, I think it has it says a lot about state failure, uh, but that's a separate pro uh, issue for another day, perhaps. But, uh, you know, across the country now, state governments, central governments are putting out these governance fellowships for which give young people the opportunity to work directly with government. Uh, so I think what choice you make is really yours. But I would say before you go back to university before you go into uh, an office setting to work with a team in in some way or form that takes you to the field the ground level understanding you will get from that will hold you strong for whatever choices you make going forward so uh, i can't emphasize that more but i mean what you know one, one of the things that we we touched on when we talked about how cpr and Ahmedabad university can potentially in the future combine over the study of public policy is the fact that very often people in India who work in this field, they do postdoctoral work or they do their masters out of India, uh, which in a way seems, given the, the, the sort of volume of expertise within India, seems a rather strange thing, which is the, one of the reasons why we're thinking of like what capacity building can uh, we do? I mean, what would you what would you say to somebody who wants to remain in India, perhaps in the aftermath of the pandemic, when international travel is a little difficult, what are the what are the routes into public policy for them? So I think uh, a few different ways. Uh, one is to become, uh, especially if you want to go on to do higher studies, is to look for places, uh, research institutions, uh, even CPR for that matter. We are forever running. Uh, ground level field studies. Uh, and that's a really good opportunity to marry both uh, understanding theoretical frameworks, analytical frameworks uh, through and lenses through which we ask questions and look at the uh, experience of policy on the ground while also getting ground level experience. So I think that's a very exciting route to take. Uh, it gives you a little bit of both. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a number of public policy schools uh, now that are doing these one year diplomas, uh, et cetera. Those are interesting opportunities, but I would say if you're taking a break for a year or two before you think of what you want to do next, which is always a good thing, uh, try and embed yourself in research work or in um, uh, working with uh, ground level NGOs that are involved in implementing programs, uh, because that will really give you a very, very good uh, uh, ground level, robust understanding of what it means to implement policy. We've all, we, one of the questions you all asked uh, at some, uh, you, or there was some response to about why policies fail. It's because implementation is done far away. Uh, that's absolutely true. Uh, and so the only way to fix that is for all of you to start uh, by going back to the ground. <laughs> okay, so let's now, now come on to questions. Now, strangely enough, because of the um, power failure and uh, you know, exiting from, from, from the meeting, the chat has been wiped out for me, but I can remember some of the questions that were on there. I also thought that it may be um, useful if anybody can send questions back to me again in chat. Yes, uh, we'll do that. I think normally when you, um, you know, when you when you do a second version of a piece of writing, uh, it's normally more concise than the first. I know when I was uh, doing my book Liberty or Death about the freedom movement and partition, that I lost electronically lost. A whole chapter and the, the new version of the chapter was a lot better than the, the version I lost much more concise. Um, but what there's one question which in fact two of the students had asked which was a very sort of theoretical question, which is do you think that India may do better with a presidential system rather than uh, prime minister and parliament the uh, you know that you know so, so would, would, a, would an executive presidency actually work better for a country like India do you think. <laughs> 
Aren't we living through a version of presidency? <laughs> uh, no, you know, look, on a serious note, I, this, this, this is something that comes up quite often uh, when we look at the way our institutions are functioning. Um, and we keep looking for alternative forms of institutions as possible solutions to the challenges that we confront. Uh, I think, honestly, whichever kind of system we adopt, the real answer is going to rest in how effectively we implement, how effectively the institutions are organized uh, and how much its internal uh, uh, systems of accountability and its embedded forces of accountability actually play out. It could work and it could go very horribly wrong. Uh, so, so to my mind, that's the wrong question to ask. Uh, the right question to ask is, what is it that we can, how does one create a culture of effective functioning and accountability where institutions perform and fulfill the very purpose for which they have been set up in the first place? Okay, so I've now got a, a couple of people who I'm hoping can unmute themselves and ask questions. Um, one of them is um, Shoria Patel, uh, the other is Professor Jimol Uni. So um, Shoria, if you're able to unmute yourself, I know that you had a question about um, constitutions and whether long constitutions are good or not. Do you want to, do you want to ask that question? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, so there's a research done by George uh, George Tesbillis and Dominic Nardi. They have studied uh, constitutions of OECD countries, and they found that uh, longer constitution have more substantive restriction. So do you think India can rewrite the constitution for better policy making where accountability is considered? I think accountability is at the fundamental core principles of the values of our constitution. Uh, and it is up to us uh, as a society to ensure that those values uh, are actually fulfilled and, 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 and enabled. Uh, it's not, again, like the question on, inst on, on presidential versus parliamentary systems. To my mind, it's not about what form, what length. Uh, it's about uh, the consensus that we are willing to arrive at uh, as a society and our willingness to live up to the fundamental principles of our constitution mm -hmm. uh, until we don't uh, go through that churning and arrive at that consensus everything else to me is a, is, is a moot point today we are really in the midst of that churning uh, and and we need to be we need to be honest and open about that uh, and ask ourselves those questions rather than get mired in in, in the details um, okay, so then, I, I mean, I, I have to say, I did wonder when, when you asked that question, whether the authors of the paper, Sebelis and Nadi, had thought that if you've got a very complex social system, as India certainly had in 47, 48, 49, and 50, and I guess still has today, do you not need a long constitution? I mean, can you really get by with a, a, a five-page version? But anyway, um, let's go across to Professor Jimol Uni. Jimol, do you want to ask your, your question? Uh, hi, Yamini. So, uh, a question which is perhaps in, on all our minds. How has the space for public policy in Delhi changed in the last few years? And uh, to add to that, uh, to what extent do you think uh, mobilization is required uh, in order to you know, push for particular kinds of policies? I'm, of course, bothered about the disadvantage, but many, many policies, including climate change. I think, uh, uh, so I think public policy, the public policy landscape has changed uh, quite dramatically uh, in two ways. One I would, one which I would argue is a natural process of evolution and the other is a, is, is a particular uh, con uh, uh, consequence of the political context in which we are. I think in some senses, uh, the locus of uh, if uh, the locus of, of policy has actually moved from the center to states. And that has been, you know, uh, and, and it's, a, it's a funny pull and pressure because at one level, there's been a lot of centralization and center encroaching on every single aspect of uh, what constitutionally rests with the state. Uh, but at the same time, the center is deeply dependent on the states uh, to get things done. Uh, and in that sense, really, if we want to leave 
strong, robust systems behind. Uh, and if we really want to engage where, with, uh, or with aspects of policy which genuinely matter to the everyday lives of people, uh, the action is at the states. Uh, and in some ways, therefore, the need is also at the states. Uh, so the, the institutional context of states are different. Uh, their institutional capabilities are different. Uh, the state uh, bureaucratic structure too has been long neglected and needs a lot of uh, engagement. So in that sense, there's been a sort of the a sort of shift in, uh, in uh, a gravitational shift closer towards the states. Although the ability of states to really be able to act as genuine self-government actors is limited by virtue of the uh, centralizing uh, structures. Um, and, and that's a sort of, that, that's a site of contestation in my view that needs to be, res that, that needs to be fought and resolved over, over, over the next decade. Um, at the same time, both of the states are now much more pronounced also at the center, this centralizing of decision-making and a very, very closed uh, uh, space of decision-making means that spaces of dialogue and deliberation uh, with the government uh, have obviously closed off quite significantly. Uh, the willingness of government to listen to critical ideas or ideas that critique accepted positions, uh, it's, a, it's willingness to have a diversity of voices on the seat, uh, uh, with a seat to the table, give a seat to the table to a diversity of voices. All of that has certainly uh, closed off. Um, and, and in some senses, the public sphere has become a much more important place uh, where debates and dialogues and deliberation on policy have to take place, uh, which goes to the question you asked about mobilization. Uh, in the current political environment, mobilization is extremely difficult uh, for all you know, reasons that don't necessarily need to be restated. But I think that makes mobilization all the more important. Um, and especially when uh, the, the sort of all formal structure of uh, uh, in the corridors of power where uh, different stakeholders, mostly elite stakeholders, but nonetheless had mm -hmm. space to bring voices in, uh, have closed. I also think many of the questions that we assumed, uh, uh, you know, consensuses that we had accepted are now kind of going through a churning, even with the farm laws. What is interesting is that, you know, un uh, up until uh, even November, the number of people that I encountered who firmly believed that, you know, we need to do market reform in a particular way are now beginning to see that actually that consensus needs to be rebuilt uh, means that policy conversations need to come into the public sphere in a much more robust way. So I'm wondering whether any of our students have questions. If they have, would they please um, put them into the chat box and I'll call on you. In the meantime, I'd like to go across to Professor Batnaga who has a question. He's the Vice Chancellor of Dr. Ram Manohar Lohia National Law University, who's joined us for the seminar today. Um, so Professor uh, Batnaga, would you like to ask your, your question? You should be able to unmute uh, your, yourself. Okay, I think there seems to be a technical issue there, just so I will read the question uh, in the meantime, which is, should the concurrent list be amended? This is a great question. For example, certain aspects of agriculture or public health be placed on the concurrent list also. Ah, this is the million dollar question that has been floating around uh, ever since the 15th Finance Commission tabled its report. Uh, they, they sort of floated this question. Uh, look, uh, to my mind, uh, I think once again, we're asking the wrong question. Uh, it's not so much about what should be on the concurrent list and, and you know, which administrative parts of uh, our decision making parts of these different subjects should rest at what level. It's that fundamental question, what level of government should be performing, what level of function. And it also is, a, and, and that itself is an issue of political maturity of share, of being able to create institutional structures where uh, the, the where, where the political process of sharing of responsibility can be maturely handed over across levels of government, mm -hmm. and I think we don't have that. So whether we create a concurrent list, or think about education. We created education as a concurrent list. I I I I'm not entirely clear what that did to address the many challenges that we confronted when we mooted for uh, education coming onto the concurrent list. It's it's about having political maturity 
authority to share roles and responsibilities and arriving at a political and social consensus on what level of government should be performing, what level of function. Okay, I'm going to invite someone else to unmute, and that is Satya Dash, if you're able to unmute, do you want to ask your um, question, which is about sort of vaccination and federalism, and whether we can learn something from the situation in Germany versus UK. Satya, are you able to, to ask your question? Yeah, I just, I'm just looking at what I wrote to you, Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, thanks, thanks for bringing me in, and uh, great talk, Yamini. Uh, you know, I'm I'm right now, uh, you know, right at the city center in Berlin, and uh, in in the first uh, wave of pandemic, we were self patting ourselves that we are perhaps in, you know, in a country that has uh, gotten it right. What the pandemic has shown is that no country has gotten it right. But on on reflection, you get to see that the UK has gone ahead. So has Serbia, has Israel in terms of vaccinating its people. Um, and, and when you look at what's happening in the landers of Germany, a lot of squabbling about what to do and all of that. So I wondered whether, you know, the classic question about states versus, you know, central versus federal uh, structure, whether uh, in, in, in the light of this pandemic, you think there's some decisions that are better suited uh, for a top-down approach? Okay, so Yamini, do you want to answer that first and then I'll say my, my thoughts on it? Sure. Um, I, I think uh, there are some decisions that needed to be taken at the center. Uh, for instance, I think the decision on how we would handle uh, the economy, particularly uh, against the backdrop of, uh, you know, what, what should be the approach uh, to designing a fiscal stimulus? How does one address the revenue crash? Uh, these monetary and fiscal powers rest firmly with the center. It was for the center to do that. It did not. On vaccinations, the center has actually tried under uh, ha has actually taken full control of how they would go about doing the vaccinations. But as it turns out, the one thing that we do know about uh, COVID uh, is that uh, it is spatially clustered. And uh, if you look at uh, uh, the combination of demand and need, you will see the demand for vaccines are also surging in places where COVID is surging. Uh, and therefore, perhaps there is a certain degree of flexibility that is needed uh, to be able to coordinate and respond. So for me, the role of the center here is uh, certainly to be able to go through all the things that the center did, ensure that you've uh, created, uh, you know, uh, created an environment for the production, ensure that you've created an environment where there's transparency on supply, which by the way, there isn't, uh, gone through all all the uh, all, all, all of the um, uh, the regulatory issues; those are all firmly for the center, and then created a coordination mechanism uh, so that states that need things at particular points in time actually are able to get them. The second thing on the on on the vaccinations is the complete and utter lack of transparency. It's an evolving scenario. Uh, there is no one vaccine that seems to have got it right of the two vaccines that we have a choice of right now in India, but the complete lack of transparency surrounding uh, the whole process. That again is a role that the center should have played, could have played, needs to play. Uh, we need to know about vaccines and reinfection. We need to know about vaccine scarcity. We need to know about uh, 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 you know, what is happening with the third phase trials for the co-vaccine. We need to know about adverse effects. There's a whole range of things that we need to know uh, because only then will we be able to get over vaccine hesitancy or uh, the citizen can stop demanding universal vaccines when they understand that there may actually be a crunch uh, that needs to be sorted out in a more sensible way. So there are things the center should do. They've not done them. There's coordination in particular. And then there are things that the state should have done and should be allowed to do still. We've not yet allowed for that. So in fact, extreme centralization and bureaucratic control. And I think this is the bureaucratic element of centralization, less the political one uh, that have got us in this rather funny place. Okay, so I, I'm going to answer the, the question as it was phrased sort of in the written version, which was really about the unitary UK uh, versus German missteps. I think what was interesting here was that, well, it, it's actually interesting in that there's a larger thing about um, uh, 
the idea of a shift out of the West and a shift to Asia and Africa and a kind of rebalancing of the world. Because one of the things that's very clear out of the pandemic is that countries that thought they were prepared for a pandemic, like the US, like the UK, were sort of catastrophically ill-prepared for knowing how to deal with it. Whereas you've seen countless other countries in the non-West that have actually had the institutional capacity for how to deal with large public health issues and therefore have had you know far better case fatality rates than for example the UK but I think that the, the, the point that you make in the question about the UK and the and vaccines which has been noticeably successful is really the result of the fact that that was the one bit of the puzzle that they organized very well um, by putting a small number of people into the management of it very early who moved to commission the production of vaccines even before they were fully developed, uh, who had experience of how to do that. Whereas, like you're saying, in a German context, uh, having this being done at a more regional level has been more challenging. And I think for the European Union as a whole, again, there are huge lessons about institution building and capacity building around how the response to the to the pandemic has, has gone wrong. Um, I wanted um, now to go over to uh, Sonal Yadav, who had what I thought was a rather um, rather good question. Sonal, do you want to do you want to un unmute and ask your question? Uh, or if that's not possible, I can I can do it on your behalf. Ah, uh, you're there, I think now. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Wonderful talk, uh, Professor Patrick and Yamini. Uh, I'm really enjoying it. So my question is very simple, and it is uh, because when any policy fails, uh, you know, people blame government. Uh, how important it is uh, uh, that you know people should also support uh, for successful implementation of policy. Because when I talk to many bureaucrat bureaucrats whom I know. They say that so now any policy that we implement, if at least 10% people are getting benefit, we consider it successful. So I said, why only 10% and why not 100%? When uh, where the problem is in this case, uh, are people not aware or people are not you know willing to take benefit of certain policies? What is the problem? <laughs> I think people are at the heart of the success of a policy, both in terms of uh, when people participate through different uh, routes, I, you know, when it comes to, say, uh, implementing uh, the provision of key public services, citizens can actually play a very active role in planning, in monitoring, in implementation, uh, when it comes to a, a, a more uh, a, a sort of uh, um, a technical uh, policy decisions, uh, building of the frameworks, uh, the creation of a public consensus around an issue uh, is critical uh, to, the, to both ensuring that uh, the, the policy framework is right, uh, but also that it therefore gets implemented well. So uh, I, I think in a democracy, there are many different ways in which people have avenues and spaces uh, to be active participants uh, in policy, uh, both from the point of view of shaping policy, but also, and I think even more crucially, to hold the state accountable uh, for its ability to do the job that it states it sets out to, to do and for and that's a fundamental premise of the social contract. Um, the challenge uh, it lies in whether or not the articulation of the policy and the structures that we create for its implementation have been uh, architected and designed in a way that genuinely enable people to express their voice their, and their voice to be responded to. And that's really the heart of the, 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 the governance challenge uh, in some senses that, uh, you know, what does it mean to create a policy architecture that is able to both absorb uh, and understand priority and be able to effectively respond to it because it is held accountable for it. Uh, that's the, in, in, I think in many of our debates in India, we assume, uh, like I said earlier, that accountability is very much about accounting. We don't talk about accountability uh, as, as the consequence of a set of actions to which we have full control of, 
making claims and asking questions. Uh, so the system is stymied uh, because it has to follow very clearly defined processes and, and the red tape that surrounds it. Uh, and it also, of course, gives it an excuse. Uh, but at the same time, the citizen is left uh, completely bereft uh, because despite placing claims of accountability on the state, the state's response is low. And I think it's that, that, that collection that creates this disenchantment, which is why we always blame the state. Um, and in the framework of rights and duties, uh, as citizens, we do have to blame the state, but we have to exercise our rights as citizens to actively hold the state accountable uh, and, uh, and, and, and fulfill our, our roles as responsible citizens in that process. Okay, I'm now going to call on one of our students, uh, Hasti Modi. Hasti, do you want to unmute and ask your, uh, your question, if you can do that? Yes, sure. Um, hello, ma'am. It feels really good to see you again and hear your views. Um, so I just had a question. Um, what are a few important skills you think that uh, students pursuing public policy, policy should focus on as of now? Um, because when they are also aspiring to be in the, uh, the administrative field and in the public practitioner field. So I think uh, one really important uh, skill, and it is a skill that has to be honed, it doesn't always come very naturally, is the ability to listen and speak uh, to and engage rather with stakeholders across the range. Uh, so uh, I, I genuinely think that you're a good public policy practitioner if you're able to uh, walk into a village and listen to uh, 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 and participate in a discussion with a women's self-help group, and you're able to walk in uh, to you know, uh, 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 an air-conditioned fancy room uh, in the Niti Aayog uh, and talk to uh, you know, secretaries, government of India, uh, about how those very minute, uh, th those very micro experiences play into how we think about the big challenge of female labor force participation. Uh, and, and that's it's not always easy to do, uh, but I think the ability to be able to listen and to be able to take those learnings and place them within uh, the, the broader macro public policy debate and speak to that debate from those perspectives is a very, very crucial skill. Uh, I think that the second really important skill um, is uh, the ability to be multidisciplinary. Uh, and uh, while I, I, I'm a multidisciplinarian, uh, I, I, I do feel uh, that it's important to be able to, it's important to have a disciplinary anchor, but you definitely need to exit from that disciplinary anchor to look at a problem through all its different uh, lenses. Uh, so if you are an economist, uh, but you're able to uh, look at problems from the lens of a sociologist or a lens of an anthropologist and vice versa, I think only then will you do genuine service uh, to what uh, public policy is all about. Uh, there's no one discipline that has the answer. Uh, it has to be a cross-disciplinary uh, dialogue and engagement. I have to say your, your answer about the need for cross-disciplinary uh, dialogue sounds like an advertisement for Underwood <laughs> University. <laughs> <laughs> In terms of the students, you know, they can be doing their, their major in economics, but uh, they can take up to 40% of their courses in very different areas. It can be data, it can be around climate science, it can be around Sanskrit, it can be around philosophy or history. So that's really so much part of our, our, our learning um, at the university. So thank you for that uh, uh, accidental endorsement. I think. <laughs> no, absolutely. <laughs> I, I think, especially living through the complexity of policy, uh, there, there is no one framework that has the right answer to what are essentially very complex social problems. Mm. Good. Well, I think that's a good moment for me to hand back to Bijal um, Mehta in order to bring the, the discussion and the seminar uh, to a close uh, this afternoon. Um, Bijal, do you want to pick it from here? Thank you so much. Uh... Yamini, and thank you so much, Professor French, for that very, very wonderful and insightful conversation. Uh, the questions were also very, very uh, inquisitive, and your responses were equally um, appropriate and informative. We look forward to stay in touch with you, Yamini, from Ahmedabad University. And uh, thank you, everyone, for your participation. Thank you, everybody. Stay safe and have a great evening. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you so you. much.